have you done many talks yet, Anna? Um, a, a couple. I've done like a couple of podcasts, and then I did one with Girls on Hills like a few days after I finished, but not loads. Oh. No, still still feeling pretty fresh. <laughs> oh, great! This is like perfect time to interview you, then, because you've just like <laughs> remembering all these stories, and yeah, it's all. Yeah, I've got cool. had a bit more time for it to like settle and reflect as well. I think. Like, it's, yeah, it's a nice amount of time after. Yeah, yeah, you're not just, like, reacting. Yeah. 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 So good. Yeah, no, I was trying to work that out, actually. I was meant to, I was going to look back on your Instagram of how, is that, like, a month since you finished? Yeah, yeah, it was the 13th of March, so a month and four days. Wow. <laughs> It's such a funny time after such a like life changing journey. Yeah, yeah, no, it is. I know it's like I don't know if a month even feels like a long time or not since it finished because it almost feels like it was just in a different specter of time. <laughs> you know, it was <laughs> like removed from normal life. <laughs> yeah, that's it because you're just in a, that sort of like mode, aren't you? Like expedition time, so you're just like yeah dealing with that and then you have to like come back into sort of um yeah an actual time zone real life time zone yeah <laughs> yeah it's kind of like you're almost in like this little bubble where you just sort of I guess forget about everything else you're just so focused on this thing and everything yeah. else just doesn't really matter and then as soon as you're out of the bubble you're just like okay well now yeah, no, I know. Yeah, and I knew I'd have so many impending life crises after I finished because like, I oh, just like, temporarily moved back to my mum's and then I'd like put my job on hold and I was like, deal with that after you finish. <laughs> and then you finish it, you're like, oh my God. <laughs> oh, it's so true. And everyone's buzzing to hear about the big trip. And you're like, oh, literally just like dealing with life admin or like, <laughs> just like dealing with like something really boring. I remember uh, getting back from around the world and I spent so much time in B&Q because my house had like fallen apart when on the tr like training for it and then been away. And so I come back and I like, had to do really boring things like put skirting boards back up or like fix the cooker that hadn't worked for ages. And uh, I'd meet people in shops and they'd be like, oh, how you doing? <laughs> like, get some nails. <laughs> Just like that <laughs> <babe. laughs> Oh dear. So, um, what are you thinking, Dana? Cool. I feel like should we make a start? I'll do yeah. a brief introduction, I guess. So, um, hi everyone. Thank you so much for taking time to join us this evening. Um, I'm Jenna. I'm from the marketing team here at Outkit, and I'm absolutely delighted to introduce Jenny Graham and Anna Wells for an evening with and um, to talk about Anna's incredible achievement of the Winter Monroe's round. So yeah, I mean, if you have any questions, feel free to drop it in the Q&A. We'll be keeping an eye on it throughout the evening. Um, and yeah, I guess, I hope you've all got a cup of tea or a beverage, but over to you, Jenny. Oh, thank you, Jenna. Yeah, I am um, so excited uh, to be chatting with Anna tonight. Um, I, I and I speak probably on behalf of the whole of the Highlands, at least, to say that you were our number one Instagram follow this winter. It was just like every day I would tune in and see where Anna was. So when I got asked to do this interview, I was over the moon. Uh, Anna is, of course, just fresh from a consecutive winter Munro round. The winter, the Munros are mountains over 3,000 feet, um, 3, feet or 914 metres. So in Scotland, we have got 282 of them. Now, if you live in the Highlands, it's a, I, I, I think it's fair to say we know a lot of people who are doing the Munros and that sort of circle of like mountaineers and hillwalkers. But actually on the bigger scale of things, only, there's only been just over 6,000 people who have uh, recorded full completion of the Munros. Even fewer of them have done a consecutive round. 
and until this year only three people have ever completed a winter consecutive round of the Monroes. But Anna has put her stamp on this and became the first woman to do so, completing the round in 83 days, matching the time of the late and very well loved uh, mountaineer Martin Moran. And yeah, just so, so excited to hear your stories tonight, Anna. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, it's a great pleasure to be here. And um, cool that so many people are interested in listening as well. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I mean that with like the buzz and I'm sure you felt it, you know, uh, both Anna and I are up in Inverness in the Highlands of Scotland. And literally the whole winter, you couldn't go to Lidl's, you couldn't go to like a party, you couldn't go to the climbing wall, you were out on your bike and everyone's chat was, are you following Anna Wells? Are you seeing what she's doing right now? Uh, so you just had like so, so many people cheering you from afar. Um, do you, did you feel that when you were when you were out? Yeah, definitely. And like, it totally surprised me how much um, momentum got behind it um, and how much, you know, even friends who were like climbers and that got so enthusiastic and on board with it as well, you know, kind of beyond just the hill walking community. Um, yeah. And I was amazed as well, like probably more than half the people I met in the hills, like knew who I was and what I was up to, um, oh, which was really cool. Um, and especially inspiring when, like I met a woman one day who said to me, you know, she was like, I'm out here because of you. Like I've been following your thing and it's encouraged me to like get back out and do more hills. And yeah, that was amazing. But I, yeah, I really felt the support and it definitely like spurred me on in an entirely positive way. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I got so many goosebumps there. You saying that. that <laughs> incredible that she was out because of you and then just like bumped into you you must have absolutely made her day um how old were you out of interest when you did your first one roll oh uh, i think i was about seven um but like hill walking wasn't a big part of my childhood like my family weren't particularly outdoorsy so i think okay. like aside from doing the duke of edinburgh stuff in school i could probably count you know on my two hands how many hill days I had as a kid like it wasn't it wasn't a lot at all until I went off to uni wow okay and were you sporty was like little Anna quite into <laughs> running <laughs> um the first thing that like really clicked with me was rock climbing so I was about like 11 or 12 when I started just indoor rock climbing through a kids club um mm -hmm. at the Inverness Leisure Centre um and yeah that was kind of where it all began for me but for the first like five or six years I mostly just indoor climb but I think I always had this like I was always quite highly strong and I always quite liked just going off and doing things so if, like when I was in my teens I'd quite often just like go out on my bike for for the day and like disappear for sort of three or four hours and do like big cycle loops and I think I definitely always had this like zest to be outdoors especially when it was a sunny day like yeah. this feeling inside me that I wanted to be out there somehow um, but I didn't have like really the tools or means to go into the mountains or climb outside when I was a teenager. What What do you mean you were uh, quite highly strung? Like, was that a, <laughs> like you were, you were using exercise to like let off some steam or energy or frustration? Yeah, I think like, I think I was always a person who wanted to try and like get the most out of every second of every day. So like when I look back on my diaries when I was a kid, like it wasn't necessarily outdoor stuff, but it was like, you know, it's always concerning. It would be like, I went for a walk with my friend from this time to this time. And then I went for a cycle on my bike from this time to this time. And then I like played on my dance mat for 30 minutes. And it was always like, just wanting to like get the most out of every single second of every day. Wow. So you were logging from that young age that really interested you, like almost like log logging dates and times. I mean, you're a mathematician, aren't you? I, yeah, yeah, my background's in that. It, it makes sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure I have memories of you from the Inverness Wall. I'm sure that's the first time I clocked eyes on you. As a, it, it probably is a teenager, um, uh, being down there. And so you went away to uni and you studied. Was it maths that you studied? Yeah, yeah, I did uni twice, but the first time I studied maths, and um, and I worked at a climbing wall while I was at uni in Aberdeen, and mm -hmm. just kind of through that, got to meet lots of other people who were into climbing and into the outdoors. 
and kind of learn my skills through like colleagues and also some like skills courses as a student and that kind of thing. Nice. But then you went, like, you didn't, uh, like, take a career in the outdoors straight away, did you? Cause you went into medicine. Yeah. Yeah, I had a few diversions. I, I yeah, I went, as soon as I finished my master's degree, I went back to uni and did medicine. And then I worked for two years as a junior doctor and found it very, very stressful. Um, and so I decided, like, I'd take some time out. So I went to live in Chamonix in the French Alps. Uh, not really with any plan. I kind of said to myself, like, take a couple of years or take a year and don't stress about what you want to do in the future. Um, but while I was living there, like most of my friends and people I were hanging out with were like guides or trainee guides. And I think that was the first time I like realistically considered working in the outdoors as a profession. Um, right. And so I just worked the way, my way through the rest of my qualifications. I mean, that's a really, like, so much insight um, to have at that point, having, you know, like, studied so hard to be a doctor, worked for two years, and then just known that, it, you know, that, that you need that break and to trust yourself enough that you can just go to Chamonix and not stress about it. I mean, that's, like, the number one piece of advice we want to give to all our young and old people, isn't it? It's like, if we, if we can, like, allow ourselves, like, trust ourselves enough to do that. Definitely. Yeah. And I think it's it's kind of more accepted in our generation as well, isn't it? The idea that you might have more than one career and that you can maybe yeah, make decisions to do things that make you happy. Like I think my grandparents, for example, found it really, really weird and hard to accept that I was going to leave medicine behind because in their day, it's kind of, you know, you just you have your career and then you stick to it and that's it. Um, yeah. But I think we live in quite a, a good time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely, to have this choice, like, we're so lucky. And so after Chamonix, you, you moved back to Scotland, didn't you? And got qualified, became a mountain guide. Yeah, so I did, yeah, climbing and mountaineering instructor qualifications. And then for, like, two and a half years, did that as a full-time thing. Um, largely working on Sky, like, guiding people in the Coolin. Um, yeah. I've always loved Sky. It's, like, my favourite place in the world. I think the more places I've gone to, the more I'm just like, oh, Sky is the absolute best. <laughs> really? Oh. Yeah. No, but, yeah. Um, yeah, then after doing that, after a particularly rainy summer, I kind of came full circle and decided I wanted a nine to five job. Um, so for the year before the mineral round, I was working for a bank doing like mathematical modeling stuff, um, yeah. which I did really enjoy. And I enjoyed the routine of that. Um, but obviously it must have caused some fire in my belly because more and more I started thinking about the idea of taking three months off in the winter to have a go at doing the mineral round. It's interesting isn't it because you look at something like you know guiding on sky and you're like oh, why for a mountaineer that's like the ultimate but actually you you just get so exhausted like it's such hard work physically and mentally isn't it like to be outside and to be working at the top of your game like that that I guess if your passion is doing it for yourself then it sort of eats into that time so yeah yeah although to be honest like I never actually felt that because I know some people say that but I never felt like it was detracting from my passion or eating away from it I think for me it was um like the lifestyle of just living on the road a bit and feeling very transient so especially mm -hmm. on sky it's like really hard to find accommodation so it was like going back and forth and everyone typically like lives out their cars and vans and I think it was more that that like uh -huh. wore it away from me but I, I like loved the work like never uh -huh. yeah 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 but like the lifestyle and just having something more steady and yeah being nice yeah. Um, and so that, what was it, um, I heard you saying somewhere that you'd watched Kevin uh, Kevin Wood's Winter 282, fantastic film, if anybody's not seen okay. it, he's still on through with it, and Kevin uh, completed the Winter Munro's, uh, a consecutive Winter Munro's in 2020. And so was that, was it like watching that, did that sort of plant a seed for you or that seed already been planted years before um, no the seed was already planted because I'd read Martin Moran's book and just the idea of a sort of time bounded clear goal orientated challenge like really appealed to me and I yeah. sort of vaguely thought about it a couple of previous winters um, but it was watching um, Kevin's film in May last year that I was like yes I want to do this and it's funny because the person I went to see it with I think 
came out kind of being like, oh my gosh, that like that looked terrible. And meanwhile, I was like, oh my gosh, I want to do that. <laughs> it's fascinating when we get that little inspiration like depending on where we're at in our minds like yeah like where that can go and um, yeah I remember reading a bit of uh, Mark Beaumont's book years and years and years ago about Romania and I was just had this like I must have just been feeling like I was ready for an adventure and I it hugely inspired me and I went away to Romania on my first bike packing trip and then I went back and read what he'd written about Romania at a different time in my life. And I was like, all oh, right, was that it? Like the, you know, but it didn't have like the same effect to me. So it's, yeah, it's just like being open. Like when you go into something, being so open as you must have been. That's so you know, what really uh, fascinates me so much about these is like we have these crazy ideas come in, in and out, you know, ideas come in and out of our lives all the time. But getting to the actual start line of that and taking the actions, like what did you have to do between, you know, going and seeing Kev's film and then actually getting to the start line in, in December? Yeah, that's a really good question. Because actually, like, for me, it was never like a total obsession. It kind of was always like this vague notion. And I wasn't, to be honest, sure if I like would enjoy it. And I remember saying to a friend of mine, um, I was like, oh, what if I organize all this time of work and then I start it and I get two weeks in to like walking up rainy hills every day and I'm like, oh, this is awful. And and she was just like, well, so what? Like if you get two weeks in and decide that that's fine. And that, so that like sparked something in me. I was like, okay, yeah, I can, it's okay to not be obsessed by it and not be totally certain um, and just go for it. But then kind of the deciding thing was like, speculatively asking my boss at work if it might be possible to get three months off and um, because again I wasn't totally sure but it was getting towards when I knew I'd have to put my notice in if they couldn't give me three months off um, and then he kind of went to like all this effort to make it go through HR and like make it possible when I hadn't quite made up my mind and then I was like oh, I, I like it, that just sort of set everything in motion and I just went along with it after that you're like I can either do it or have three months on the couch so yeah. <laughs> well, as well give it a go and did you in terms of like skill set I mean you were hugely you know you had so much um so much knowledge and time in the mountains by then did you feel like you had the toolbox to to deal with what a, min a winter min uh, mineral round would take yes yeah I felt very confident that I had like the skill set in the toolbox and I wasn't kind of worried about any of that. I think like the things that worried me was injury largely, because I seem like super prone to injury, like soft tissue injuries and stuff. And I actually had like a big string of disasters right before I started and wasn't sure if I'd even get off the ground. And um, that was the main thing that, that worried me. Um, or if the weather was just like so atrocious that, um, you know, I, that it wasn't gonna be possible. But I think, yeah, I felt confident that I had the, the skills to do it. That, that is a nice way to go into something like that, isn't it? Um, so what, like, talk us through the nuts and bolts of it being a winter and a consecutive winter round as well. So, like, what are the timings around that? What were you expecting? What is, yeah, what what uh, what things did you have to think about? It? Sure. Um, so... The timings I went for, I didn't think too much about it. I just kind of copied what um, Martin and Kevin had done, which was to use the, uh, no, now I've forgotten which one it was, meteorological winter, I think. Yeah. Okay. So it's from the shortest day until the spring equinox. So usually the shortest day is the 21st of December, but because of the timings of um, the exact, I don't know, setting of the sun this year, it was actually the 22nd of December which suited me quite well because um, it was like atrocious weather on the, the 21st. The first few days were pretty bad anyway, but the 21st, like I'm not even sure if I would have gone out if that had been day one. Um, but then I kind of won the bit day back with it being a leap year. Um, so that balanced oh. out quite nicely. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, I guess so the kind of rules to it are you just deal with whatever conditions get thrown your way. So obviously the extra challenges of winter are you've got much less daylight so especially around yeah the shortest day it's probably only like six or seven hours daylight but it was kind of nice starting on the shortest day and then you know that from now on every day is getting a little bit 
longer if that's a good feeling um, yeah. and then generally yeah you're gonna have snow to deal with so that gives you a kind of whole host of extra things to think about like um avalanche conditions and often it's going to be a lot slower moving if you've got fresh deep snow to wade through compared to walking on a track and um, so you're going to be using sometimes axes and crampons uh, and then i guess yeah you've just got like the cold that comes with winter mm-hmm. and storms typically a lot more mm-hmm. storms come <laughs> yeah a lot more storms tell us how tell us about the storms uh-huh. Yeah, there were so many storms at the start. <laughs> it's funny, yeah, the first two days, I actually had a rest day on day three because I was so, so exhausted. Because um, the first two days were like really, really brutal. And Kev Woods actually came and joined me on the first day and who who completed the winter round three years ago. And I remember saying to him, I was like, oh, like how often was it this windy and wild on your round? And he kind of laughed at me and was like, uh, more than half the time. And I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> like this is horrendous um and I hadn't even brought goggles with me because I think because I've never really been like a hill walker I've always been like I guess more of a climber and in my head goggles like ski goggles were something that was part of my climbing kit or my skiing kit so I didn't think to bring them hill walking and I remember like coming off the hill at the end of the day just like hail blasting in my face and realizing how critical they were and I think I actually wore goggles like three quarters of the days on the round in the end (laughs) yeah there were so many storms and like to be honest I kind of I feel like everything was quite nicely spread out for me so in like December January it would be like nice weather terrible weather nice weather terrible weather and it was quite a good balance because when it was nice weather I'd go and try and do these really big days but then you'd be getting home at like 11 o'clock at night trying to like reorganize all your kit, eat some food, plan your routes for the next day, going to bed at midnight, and then you're like getting up at six. And it was just like very nonstop. But then when that was kind of interspersed by the really bad weather, then you'd kind of go and do these like smash and grab shorter days and actually then have much more downtime. So it was like gnarlier when you were out in the hills, but then you had more time to to chill out. And I think the balance of that. Yeah, that because that fascinated me about it. Because I just, um, I think I asked you probably a hundred times, like, oh, how many Munros have you got left? How many Munros have you got left? <laughs> and you were like, no, I'm not doing it in Munros. I'm doing it in days. So mm-hmm. how did you work out like what your days were going to look like, or, or like what, um, uh, how to get the most Munros, I guess, within a day? Yeah. So I maybe if I put my thing up blur, I, I have my little map behind me, um, but what I did so I hadn't done all the minerals before I'd only done like about 100 of them so I didn't have good knowledge of like the natural loops in the areas so my strategy was because I only had two days off work before I started for like all my planning (laughs) so my strategy was to like learn the kind of 100 north minerals and have an idea as to how I do them as loops Um, and then as I had rest days throughout kind of learn the southern ones if that makes sense so yeah. wait, I'll put my thing off and see if I can show you my yeah, that would be nice. background. Although I'm not uh, settings. Okay, I think that's off blur, and I'll see if if I bring it close to the screen. If you'll see this. Uh, yeah. I I used a mixture of like yeah online things like Watk Islands and Steve Fallon and just looking at OS maps and and then I draw the little loops like that and have like a distance and a height for each loop if that makes sense yeah just like statistics to me (laughs) And, and then it meant on any given day I could kind of have a look at what I had left and the scale of it and where the weather was good and how I felt and just go to the areas and then obviously I'd I'd try and like do a few sets in the same area at a time so I was very very fortunate that lots of wonderfully kind people reached out on social media to invite me to stay with them so I was able to go and have like mini bases and do a few a few loops like that and yeah with the loops I it was like a mixture of longer ones and shorter ones as well so you could always play something to the weather 
if that makes sense. Yeah. It gives you the, the advice as well, like the worst thing you can do is break up one of your loops. So sometimes in a morning, if I was like, oh, actually, I'm really tired or the forecast to change, I would like be really, really flexible and just change my plan and go and do something shorter to avoid breaking a big loop rather than breaking the loop and that just say that was just because it was more efficient with like the distance you had to walk or the elevation you had to climb uh yeah yeah exactly just or to do a shorter loop basically yeah 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 but breaking oh, up yes yeah exactly doubling up and um, your weather forecasting again like I basically didn't need to look at the weather all winter because I was just like <laughs> where is it good because Anna is going to be there yeah <laughs> I know, what was what what was base like like how were you weather reporting and keeping an eye on it all and like what were you using to do that um so i i probably spent more than an hour every day looking at weather forecasts because not only was i i was almost trying to like track and memorize how much snow was falling in different places if that makes sense so if i was like in the south and thinking about going north the next week i wanted to like get an idea of what the ground conditions would be like there so the the forecasts i typically used were like Met Office for like wind speed um, and I use YR.no a lot because it gives you I think quite an accurate like hourly precipitation so that gives you an idea as to how much snow is going to fall um, and then just looking at MWIS and the avalanche forecast although I was quite lucky with like volumes of snow there was a brief period after New Year where there was a lot of snow um, and avalanche risks were quite high so I just went east to the Eastern Cairngorms and did like all the big flat plateau ones with snowshoes on, which was lovely. <laughs> yeah, I love that. That you just yeah, you popped on your snowshoes and uh, and went off and did some big some did some big uh, big loops. Um, how long did you have your snowshoes on for three days? Yeah, I think I think there was maybe like five days where I used snowshoes. Um, I loved them though, like. I'd, so in the past, I'd done my international mountain leader qualification um, mm -hmm. in France. And so that's like snowshoeing. And yeah. when you're using them there, it kind of feels like a novelty. And it's like a fun thing that rich people do to like walk between huts and eat fondue. Um, but actually, like, they're such a functional mountain tool. Like, they were such a good way to get around in the in the deep snow. <laughs> That's brilliant. And did you, because obviously, like, I'm a skier, so I straight away thought, why didn't she just have skis? But were they more efficient? I don't know. So I was a bit weird with my rules I set myself, because for some reason in the beginning, I was like, I'm only going to walk, like, I don't want to ski. Um, okay. I, like, and I, I don't know why I decided that was less pure in some way. And I think at that point, I didn't actually know that Martin Moran had skied on his. And anyway, I later paraglided off a hill, so I changed all my rules. But um I, yeah, I think if I did it again, I might have skied some of them, but okay. I think the snowshoes actually had a lot of advantages over skis as well. Like if the snow level wasn't down where you were parking, they're obviously much lighter to carry. And then if you've got a mixture of kind of rough terrain and the ones I had like had really good crampons on them. So even like going up sort of steep, hard, compact snow, they were like pretty rapid, I think easier than skis. Ah, interesting. Yeah. And you used the bike as well, though, didn't you, to like get into a couple of bits? Yes, I, I, quite a lot of times. I think I counted it was like 15 days or so I used the bike. In, nice. In yeah, oh, so it was so back in my car all winter. <laughs> but only to get to the foot. You didn't start, you didn't uh, want to venture up the hill with a bike. No, it like yeah, there was often like a little bit of a scent, but it never it never came too far. I'm not a very good cyclist, and often I'd be like hating my bike on the way in because it always felt so like slow, and I'm like, oh, I'll be faster walking. But some of my most like epic single moment memories from the round are like end of the day under a starry sky, just like blasting down a track on my bike, and yeah, I have so many cool little memories of that. And here, just... like jumping across the road I don't know if you've ever had that on a bike that yeah. you know the way you have to look out for deer in the car I like genuinely had to slow down a lot on my bike so I was thinking like gosh if these deer hit me that's gonna really hurt on a bike oh big time yeah big time there was a, a woman out in the Pyrenees Anna um, a really good endurance rider another Anna uh, who got who hit a wild boar when she was like in in the dark coming down a massive hill and oh my goodness 
came off a lot worse than the boar that, that you know survived but yeah it's a real it can be a real issue but I have never ridden in somewhere and regretted that I've got my bike at the end of the day <laughs> it's always yeah. such a joy to come back to that's a good lesson and sometimes like you yeah, on the way in the tracks don't always feel like they're uphill and then it's only on the way down when you're absolutely flying. You're like, oh, that was so worth it. Yeah, big time. Yeah, you've got these big glens that you just such gentle sort of gradient. Eh? And do you know what I wondered quite a lot when um, when you were getting around was about the driving? Because I know Kev Woods t talks about that um, in his round. And I know like when I've done things, I think like a massive day and I'm like, yeah, I'll just drive back then like the driving can be really full on. Like how did, how were you coping with that? Were you getting the help with that or do you need yeah, yourself? Yeah, I, I did, most of the driving I did myself and I actually felt fine. Like I wouldn't have, I obviously wouldn't have driven if I felt tired and um, yeah. too tired to drive. I often would like chat to like one of my parents on the phone on the way home as well, which was quite a nice way to just like reflect on the day and wind down as well. Um, yeah. If I was ever going for a day out, with friends from Inverness then um they would always very kindly drive which was yeah. was really nice um and on the way home I'd often I I like hate being super selfish but I'd be like oh do you mind if I just like sit on my phone for a minute and I can get like my Instagram post done and I can check the weather for tomorrow and make my plans for tomorrow so that was always mm -hmm. like an uber bonus when someone else would drive and you do all your admin on the way home and then get home and just be able to actually relax and eat your food for a bit <laughs> Yeah, so nice. And I mean, I always imagined that I would be like, oh, I bet Anna just wants to like lie and chill out and, you know, get back and be cozy. And then I would see things popping up on Instagram and it's like, had a night off, so went to the climbing wall or went out <laughs> for dinner. And like, you seem to be able to be really sociable at the same time as, as doing this. It Was it was that like a nice switch off for you or yeah did you find the social aspect difficult at any time I think um I think I was a bit naive about how intense the round would feel like I think I thought that every evening I'd be like down the climbing wall hanging out with friends and I I did a lot less of that than I thought I might um mm -hmm. but for me like I I think that contrast was really important to me so for me it worked well to do big days and rest days and in the rest days, just do like really normal things. Like dad hosted yes. his annual Burns night supper in the middle of it. And I was like looking forward to that for ages. And oh, yeah, just doing kind of normal things for me. And that contrast between like gnarly suffering and then super cozy, comfy, chilling out. Um, yeah. Really worked well. Like, I don't think I could have done it in a van. Like, I think psychologically, I wouldn't have been strong enough to just like go back to a lonely van and have a sort of, cold night <laughs> yeah. yay so that that downtime was just as important I mean that's the bonus of like living here isn't it that you've got that Absolutely. opportunity to be like on the west coast east coast and and sort of make it make it back home um, earlier on today, we put out um, a shout out on Instagram for some questions. Um, and if you've, if anyone listening is or watching tonight has got any questions, please pop it in the Q and A box at the bottom, and we'll come to it. Um, but Johnny Cook, who you probably know from the wall, Johnny's a photographer around Inverness, and he asked earlier on um, about your lowest point. Like, did you have lows out there? Because again, you know, we saw a lot of highs. We saw a lot of your highs. And uh, how did you get through them? So I think like two moments spring to mind um, when you say that. One is kind of the majority of Noidart. So I really want to go back to Noidart because I feel like I didn't properly enjoy Noidart. Um, mm. But like I did that as a two day Bothy trip and about 5K into the first day, I got this like, horrendous pain in my heel like it felt like something had clicked out of pay place and it was like I somehow figured out it was better to continue because like all the logistics were in place someone was coming in to meet me in a bothy that I wouldn't be able to contact like this man with a boat was kindly picking me up the next day so I just cracked on but I walked like 25k in total agony like using my poles as crutches and it wasn't just the pain that made me sad it was the fact like this feeling of like how on earth can this get better enough that I'm going to be able to carry on like I felt yeah. like surely this is it over like how can this get better 
Um, it was early doors, wasn't it? This was like, like, no, like this, still December. This was the second episode. There was there was a different foot problem in December, but this was take two in like it must have been early February, I think. Right. Um, one. But the same physio fixed me. Um, she was like a superhero. I when I was on one of the mineral tops in Noidart, I sent a like a message on a messenger where I got signal and like fully explained the symptoms and the pain I was feeling. And when I got to the last mineral before I dropped down to the Bothy, she'd sent me um, like a WhatsApp video showing me this exercise that I could do to like click my talus bone back into place. Um, so I got down to the Bothy and like was doing these exercises and it, it worked, like it was unbelievable. <laughs> um, but then the next day I was still like, it was I was still like quite sore because everything had been hurt all day and it was really hard to make myself walk normally again. And I was just like really tired and drained. So in general, like Noidart feels like a little bit of a, off a low. Um, yeah, because yeah, it's... That, yeah, I think the hardest things for me to push through is like that feeling of it being out of your control. Like it's one thing to be like, oh, well, I'll just try harder, I'll keep going or find ways to motivate yourself. But the idea of like an injury stopping me was like properly heartbreaking. Like I think that yeah. was yeah the worst um, and I know Shona um, McPherson was online today and she was asking like do you find it easy to be kind to yourself a lot of the time when you know if if you are tired or you're going through this are you like are, yeah you're quite self-critical or are you do you manage that well ah that's a good question I I think yeah I, I think because I was maybe pushing myself quite close to my limit sometimes it was hard to know when you were tired in a way that you're meant to push harder or where you're tired in a way that you're <laughs> meant to listen to yourself and rest if that makes sense yes it does. I think you're looking in a way that you fully understand that and you've been there as well I think um, but definitely there was like one day where I properly bailed um on my own so I was like I'd wanted to link together six Monroes around Ben Gerag near Ullapool and I yeah. ended up coming down after three which if you know those Monroes is like a ludicrous place to come down because where I was on the call would only have been like 40 minutes to one top 40 minutes to another and then down and I like I remember really wrestling with that decision to go down I just had this overwhelming sense that I wanted to be in bed it was like the start of when I got ill and I remember saying to myself like you cannot look back and regret this like you have to respect the version of you who is here right now on the hill deciding to go down like you cannot look back and be annoyed with yourself mm. and yeah I think it's important to that's to... so good yeah <laughs> how how far in were you at that point where you made that decision that was pretty near the end of the round like I think I had uh like less than 10 days 10 hill okay. days left to do so it was, yeah. yeah, it was also that knowledge that like, I'm going to be walking back because it's a really long way into those Monroes. It's like yeah. 10 feet up a track. And I remember walking down thinking like, you're going to be walking back along here, like probably in the next week or so. So that was a bit frustrating. It's like that reminder. I used to remind myself or I still do if I'm doing something, I'm like, right, literally nobody wants this more than you. So if you can't go any further tonight or you can't, you know, do whatever it was you'd set out to do today, there's a good reason for it. Like, just trust yourself that you want it yeah. enough. Um, yeah, it's, like, it's so it's so good. It's such a good reminder. So. If I, I I love being out in the moons. Like I it was cycling across the southern hemisphere when it was winter and it was just like the moon and the night sky just brought me alive. It was like, you know, people talk about sunsets, but I got that watching the moon go up and watching the stars at night. Did you must have had so much of that? Because you were in expedition time. Like you didn't care if it was like <laughs> two in the afternoon or eight at night. You just wanted to know where the weather was good, where the snow was good. So yeah, what was like did you have magic magic night skies yeah I think my best night sky was probably quite near the start when I did the like the South Glenshiel Ridge um and I linked the kind of two extra at the end to do it as nine but I think yeah the sun must have set at like four o'clock and I was out until 11 and I didn't need a head torch like I didn't want to switch on my head torch because the moon was so bright and it was just phenomenal it was so so beautiful and I also mm -hmm. realized um I think there was yeah, there was one day where I was kind of like, 
it was really poor visibility and then it must have cleared and it, but I was still trying to like nav with my compass and I was wearing snowshoes and it was really awkward like trying to hold the compass and the poles to move and I remember realizing that I was like oh I can just walk towards that star like I can just pick a star and keep and keep walking towards it which was like a cool bonus of the night sky. <laughs> Oh, that feelings of like, yeah, being a feral mountain woman. <laughs> yeah, <totally. laughs> Oh, and I mean, you touched on the fact that you paraglided. I love that about this. Like you just made it your own. And I know you like, you put out there, you're like, I'm not sure, like, I, you know, I played about with this, whether it's like true to, you know, form or not. Um, but the fact that you just like love paragliding and you were like, I'm just going to hype this massive sail up the mountain. <laughs> and of course the first one you didn't get, but then you did, you did get one with your brother. Just, yeah, that was beautiful. What, what mineral were you, did you paraglide off? Uh, yeah, no, it was so good. I think the, again, before I started, like with the whole not skiing thing, I was like, oh, I'm going to do it as pure as possible so that nobody could like discredit it. But I think by like more than halfway through I was like oh like I knew how much work I'd put it into it all and I just felt so like kind of proud and confident of it and I was like this is my ride and I'll do what I want <laughs> and you know, like it became more of a personal thing you know I was like I know that I want to do this for me um, and yeah. I know that like all together paragliding only really makes it harder because you've got to like carry this big thing up um, and as you say I carried it up one hill that I then carried it back down because I couldn't take off because it was windy um, yeah. So yeah, it was Ben Scree I can't say it, Ben Screefiel, the one like above Armistale, like around opposite Noidart, like around the coast from Kyle of the Kalsh. Um and honestly, like it was amazing. Like it, it was probably like the best flight I've ever had. It was quite stressful taking off because it was quite windy, and I'd planned to take off down the uh, uh, West Ridge, and when I got there and looked, it was all like jagged and like rough and I don't have the skills or confidence to like commit to launching off that so it took me quite a while to find somewhere like safe to take off from um but then I managed and it was just the absolute best flight ever it was so cool <laughs> I was My so goodness. glad oh yeah absolutely imagine looking back now and you hadn't done the flight it would just be gutting wouldn't it yeah <laughs> so much um what uh, what were the what were the coolings like to do because i mean they're technical enough in summer like did you do that in one in one go or did you stay up there or so with the coolings like i so i have done a single one day traverse before back in 2016 and generally recall that as being one of the best days of my life um like a winter traverse sorry in 2016 yeah like a yeah. single one day winter traverse and so I kind of had this obsession about the Coolins on the round. It was like a little pipe dream that I wanted to ideally do a one day traverse, but at least do them in like full proper winter conditions. Because obviously it would have been easier to like pop over during one of the snow free yeah. times and do them. But I was checking the forecast like almost constantly uh, for the Coolins to, to get them in good condition. And actually I ended up going to do the Anahiga as quite a last minute plan one Friday. Um, and it was like deep, fresh snow and it was just amazing. And during that day, I was like, I want to go to Sky this weekend. <laughs> so I quite last minute, I like messaged a few buddies because I didn't want to do it on my own. I was keen to have a partner for the Keelans in case we wanted yeah. to roll up for bits. And um, so I messaged a few people um, and ended up going with a guy, Tom, who I actually had never climbed with before, but was a good friend of a friend. Um, and we set off early from the Glen Brittle end, kind of with the idea I wasn't too bothered if we did all of them, but I wanted to at least do the Southern Eight because in the Coolins, it's quite a long way between Monroe's Eight and Nine. And I think time-wise, it would almost be as efficient to do them as like the Southern Eight and then the Northern Three. Um, okay. But it would have been kind of cool and novel to do the full traverse. But in the end, we didn't because the snow was, it was just not good for it. So basically all the fresh snow had this layer of grout pool underneath. So like two inches of like ball bearings, basically like little hard little pillow uh, pellets. And then on top about a foot of fresh snow. So what would happen is you'd be like stood on something that felt good. And then the whole thing would just go. So we were having to end up, like we roped up for more than we thought we'd have to. We did a kind of massive detour to miss a section. So it just made it a bit slower going. Um, wow. So sounds full on but you're not saying it in a way that you're phased by it whatsoever 
no it was awesome it, yeah the quills was everything i hoped it would be like blue skies proper winter conditions felt very like authentic and real so that was amazing. amazing did you have to like were you worried to buy or did you come across any other sort of snow pack that was avalanche and that you were on for a bit and like oh, maybe i shouldn't be here or was it um, did you win your forecast quite well that you weren't in that situation the the only other like avalanche concern actually turned out to be a big positive because i i'd planned this way to link up the six monroes in glencoe um it was like from appen over to um glencoe and basically i'd i got a bit spooked out halfway because the viz was really poor and everything was like all the boulders were kind of very icy and rhymed up and I was going up quite steep ground and you couldn't pick your line well because of the mist and you kind of end up in cliffy bits and so I decided I'm going to bail after I do um oh now I'm going to forget all the names that's embarrassing <laughs> Didion is that the one I mean yeah 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 um, yeah yeah, I was going to bail after the two Bidian ones. So that would have been the third and fourth one of the day. But then I realized when I was up there, I was like, oh, the only, the kind of normal route off is like down the call in between Bidian and the other summit. And yeah, it was exactly the aspect that was like moderate avalanche risk that day. And I looked at it on the way up to the other summit and I was like, oh, that doesn't look good. I don't think I want to go down there. So I kept going to the other summit and I was like, well, now my only descent safe option is either to go all the way back over Bidian and that really long descent and then end up like 10k away from my car like or to just continue what I was going to do for the rest of the day so I lost my option to bail and basically kept going along the ridge and it actually got yeah nicer and better and the weather cleared wow. and I didn't have any concerning slopes that way so if it hadn't been for that avalanche risk I might have bailed and given myself a whole extra loop to go and do <laughs> so it kind oh, of helped me. Yeah, so that's like going down into the Lost Valley, isn't it? That and that yeah. sort of thing. I don't, I can't pronounce the one across from Vidian either, but I know, I know the one or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, because that descent into it is so sketchy, isn't it? It looks yeah. uh, well for me anyway. I find it. Yeah, I would want it to be perfect conditions, um, yeah. to uh, get into it. Were um, were there other um? were there surprising hills like you'd done half of them before but then so that's like you know or you've done a hundred so you've got like another 180 hills that you haven't been in was there any areas that you were like really surprised at and sort of away from the big glory ones of like the west coast or the coolings that's a good question um let me think i think the korean larich ones like maybe a little bit caught me off guard because I think that was the thing as well is because I was doing like as a climber I maybe got overly complacent about the idea of like I'm just going hill walking if that makes sense and I realized that actually when I was linking together some of the groups that are normally done together and I was maybe just picking lines that people had linked up in summer so like copying some of Steve Fallon's routes mm -hmm. for example um I was maybe like in my planning a bit blasé about just assuming everything would be fine. And yeah, especially the way I linked together the seven Korean Larix, there was a couple of sections where I was a bit out of my comfort zone. I like, I basically, um, to be completely honest, I'd brought, so I'd worn spikes quite a lot. Um, and that day I I knew that there was fresh snow on hard compact snow. So I'd brought with me crampons as well. And because it was a crampon setup that I'd used previously on a lot of trainers, I hadn't even thought about whether they'd fit well on the boots that I happened to be wearing. I just kind of assumed they would, um, yeah. but they just didn't fit on my boots at all. Like I couldn't get them to stay on. They just kept popping off. And so I said to myself, like, okay, you've got your spikes, just go um, until you don't feel comfortable. But then obviously you push yourself a little bit further than you should. And the spikes were just utterly useless because it was like two inches of kind of fresh snow on a compact base. Yeah. So they weren't like biting into the actual ice. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I really struggled with my footwear in general, to be honest. I've got really bad feet and I really struggled to wear firm boots because of my bunions. Um, oh. Like even after getting all my boots stretched out, um, they were really uncomfortable. So after that, my kind of compromise was I often took two axes because I thought that then if I had to go on like hard compact neve on slightly steeper ground and was only wearing 
either spikes or I had these kind of in between strap on crampons that didn't have front points, but they had bigger spikes. But yeah. I almost always carried two axes after that because I was like, well, if I've got slightly less secure feet, I can a bit make up for that by having more yeah. secure. Axes. Yeah. Amazing. Thanks for being honest. It's not always yeah. easy when <laughs> you're like, this is going to sound dodgy, but here's here's what I did to get you. <laughs> Um, you, I was listening to you uh, talk about being alone and like, or um, I heard an interview that you'd done and you talked about getting in touch. Loads of women had got in touch with you. And obviously you talked about that woman that you've met um, uh, out in the hills. Like, I'm so inspired with what you're doing. Like just watching this woman out there absolutely smashing it in winter. And then how that sort of had to change or that you felt like that you should maybe change the way that you were doing things because she'd been going with people and yeah it's just like really interesting it'd be really cool to hear a bit more about that and like what uh, if that chain like did that bring extra fear did that bring extra like what were the emotions for you making that decision yeah okay so I think like in the beginning I'd gone a mixture with people and not with people like probably half and half the first few weeks and I think like like safety wise or comfort wise it didn't really make any difference to how I felt if I was with someone or not for the most part um but I had this yeah I had this kind of rule in my head I didn't want to go out on the hill with anyone who is like less fit than me or less experienced than me because from like a completely selfish perspective like that would be the worst thing that could happen um on a day is to have to like turn back because someone else wasn't happy um, and even just if a day became a few hours longer because you were with a slower person, it kind of all quickly adds up to like hours on the hill, hours in bed. Um, yeah. But then kind of the consequence of that, just because there was more guys into mountaineering, um, most of the time when I was out with people, I was um, out with guys. And I was like, oh, maybe that a little bit takes away from it if people are thinking, oh, it's really cool, this woman doing this round. But if then I'm just kind of out with guys who are stronger than me all the time, I was like, oh, maybe that takes away from it. Whereas I knew that to me, it probably didn't make that much difference to me. I was like really happy on my own. Um, yeah. So after, I think I was doing, yeah, I did a lot more days on my own, like especially the second half. Um, but not just for that reason, like actually it was easier for flexibility to not be accountable to anyone because yeah. I was like quite often just changing plans last minute in the morning and like darting here or there. And I always felt guilty. Like if I made a plan with someone, I'd be like, I'm so sorry, I'm going to bail or I want to do this other thing and in many ways it was easier to just like be on your own yeah um, I totally understand that trying to organize a bike ride in advance it's like worst nightmare isn't it it's like I'll just <laughs> um oh I there I could literally chat to you all night long you've got so many amazing stories uh, but people have been putting in their questions and I'm like I can't hog you all to myself uh, so I'm going to start I'm going to start reading some of them out and uh, you can you can give us some answers for them so Fiona very practical question to start with Fiona Parkinson wants to know what crampons you used you sort of covered that but any mates, oh, yeah. so th three different pairs four different pairs actually for the most part um and yeah what I'd also say about what I was saying about my sketchy crampon use is that that's kind of on the back of like many many years of experiences and fully understanding the limitations of kit and knowing when I was pushing it and knowing when I wasn't if that makes sense um like yes. I made it seem more blasé than it was um but the, yeah the ones I used I had Catula spikes um I had another one also by Catula which are like kind of strap-on crampons that um they've got quite big spikes but they don't have front points is the main disadvantage to them but they're a lot more than spikes and then Petzl link crampons I think were the ones I used most with boots um, and then I had some kind of hybrid where I mixed up a pair of my uh, oh I can't even remember the two brands but lightweight aluminium ones that had good front front points as well so kind of a mixture of all of those. Brilliant that's fantastic info and um, do you have a favourite Munro from Alex? Oh well, maybe I'd say Ben's Greetle, the one I flew off, because that was just really cool. <laughs> oh, that sounds magic. I've never done that one, but you've made me want to go and do it now. Um, and from Campbell, uh, do you have any advice for beginner Monroe baggers? Um, I guess to, like, 
start in the summer, I guess, and just like build up experience slowly and steadily and all the skills, the skills to go with it. And I think like nowadays, a lot of people use electronic navigation, but I think it's, it's really good and important to learn map and compass stuff because when you can read and understand a map, it gives you so much freedom to be able to plan your own adventures, like when you can understand the terrain and what you're looking at. So yeah, I think like take your time on the quest and learn all the skills as you go. Oh, great advice. And it's such a beautiful journey, to be on, isn't it? Like, I remember learning to navigate and feeling like I've just got this new tool that literally, I can always know where I am in the whole world. It's like, I understand, <laughs> like, I understand. It's the so liberating, isn't it? And like, not so, having to panic if the mist comes in or the dark comes in and just like, yeah. Doing it. Yeah, it's yes. time well spent for sure. Um, Bridget's asking about um, if you could elaborate on overcoming the challenges of nav or lighting at the end of the day, but it, perhaps that's it, that sort of covered it. If you've got the skill set, then perhaps it's not too much of a too much finishing. Yeah, definitely the hardest the hardest moments for nav were when it was dark and it was like blizzarding. So you've got your head torch, but all you can see is like it reflecting off all these bits of snow immediately in front of you like you can't even see your toes and in snowshoes you've got two poles that you're trying to use so it's really hard to hold the compass like they were the most frustrating moments where you're like oh and yeah I kept thinking it'd be really good to design like a compass holder on like a pole or on your wrist or something I don't know <laughs> Came up with yeah, that would <laughs> yeah, be so good um, do you was there any time that you felt like you like you weren't psyched for it like it was something that you weren't that you might actually give up and do or were you just like for that you know three months just absolutely tuned in and never thought about quitting yeah more or less just absolutely buzzed the whole time there was one day like uh, which I wrote about in my Instagram post, which coincided with the day before my period, like about a month in, where I remember just feeling so low motivation and I couldn't be bothered like going out to do the hills. And I remember it so profoundly because it was such a contrast to all the other days. But I remember thinking to myself, like, gosh, if I if I feel like this for multiple days, like, will I keep going? Like, would I want to keep pushing myself if I felt low motivation? Um, yeah. yeah. It yeah. is amazing that, isn't it? If you feel pain, like if your mind sets that things are sore, things are cold, things are hard, then actually pushing through that is so difficult. But if your mindset is, this is fun, this is an adventure, this is amazing, then all of a sudden it's like way, way easier. Um, yeah. yeah, I always think I'm actually quite bad at suffering. It's just that I never think that I'm suffering. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You kid yourself. But me um just uh, to finish up i did an interview for this amazing woman uh, kate strong check it out she's 45 this year and she's been interviewing 45 women about what it means to be strong to them and she started and ended the interview with that very question what does being strong mean to you and i just thought it was such a fantastic question to finish on Oh, you threw that on me. <laughs> I feel like it's a question that requires some good prep to think of a really like thoughtful, insightful answer. Um, you've been you've been insightful enough, don't worry. <laughs> I well, I'm gonna say something like like I think being strong is about like uh like having the confidence to be true to yourself and just being you, if that makes sense. Like yeah, yeah doing something as you and for you rather than yeah, like to prove anything or be anything. I absolutely love that answer um, and you know it doesn't yeah it doesn't need to be physically strong it's like having that confidence to go go do you can be the hardest thing in the world and um, thank you all for joining in tonight we've had so many people and uh, we've not managed to get through all the questions but so many people have uh, joined tonight and been in touch and been really really psyched uh, for this interview so thank you Alpkit for putting it on, for supporting Anna's uh, round and just being like all round awesome people. And Anna, thank you so much. I know that you've got a book on the cards. I know that you're like about Highland. I'm sure you're going to turn up at festivals. There's going to be talks. I just know that we're going to be hearing loads more stories from you. So yeah, delighted to have caught some with you tonight. 
Oh, yeah, thank you so much for having me and thank you everyone for coming and then staying to listen. <laughs> and thank you, yeah, Jenny for interviewing me and Alpkit for hosting. Not at all. Thank you. <laughs> Nice one. Cool. Okay. Well, yeah, um, just to echo what Jenny said, thank you everybody for joining us this evening. It's been, I've absolutely loved hearing out the stories and your journeys, all your challenges, and I'm, I'm feeling inspired and I hope it has inspired everybody else. So, yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you. Hope everybody enjoys the rest of their evening and we'll catch you all soon. <laughs>